Good morning. Oh, good. oh, you're awake. Okay. <laughs> All right. Good morning for tomorrow. Good afternoon. Well, um, this is going to be a simple presentation. It has been a long day, and it's difficult to, pe to speak to people with a full stomach. If they fall asleep right away. But uh, I, I, I want to begin by giving us a general idea of where we are and then go back to the family. In Daniel 11, we had the king of the north and the king of the south. Have you, have you heard of that? Yes. In Daniel 11? Okay. We know that the king of the north eventually will win and defeat the king of the south. However, for a time, the king of the south will be prevailing, moving forward, and gaining ground to the point that then the king of the, south, the north will defeat him once and for all. As you continue in Daniel 11, at the end, God defeat the king of the north as well, and he established his kingdom. So where we are right now, we are in, Rev in Daniel 11.41. I'm not going to get there because that's not the point of the talk this afternoon. But in Daniel 11.41, we see the king of the north, which is the papacy, conquering America. And in the process of conquering America, is also trying to conquer the people of God. Not just America as, as a nation, but the only people in America and in the world that has a message that will doom the kingdom of Satan is this movement. Amen. Amen. No other movement has a message that will do any harm to, to Satan. It's this final movement that God has given us a message that will put an end to Satan himself his kingdom, and sin forever. Amen. Yes, Lord. However, he has to use people like you and I. So he's, he's use, is he, if he's using us, he's in desperate condition. Because he's scratching the bottom of the barrel, if you know what I mean. So, but God is good. That's all right. So right now, we see the king of the south moving forward. Let me give you an example. America. America used to be Protestant, and it used to be a republic. That's gone. There's no republic anymore. Not even a democracy. Not even a democracy. What we have today is an oligarchy. A few people running the show. And every day, you have few, fewer people running the show. You know, that there are five, five forms of government. Republic is number one. Number two is democracy. And when I said republic, republic is the government that rules by law. And from the president all the way down, everybody is ruled by the same law. And if you break it, you're a crime. If you have committed a crime, you have to pay for it. Democracy is the rule of the majority. That's when the majority rule. That's not, that's not a good government, though. Even though that's what you hear on the news all the time. Democracy, democracy. Stay away from it. Every single democracy in human history has failed. Every single one of them. And they have ended up in a revolution. So let me give an example of what democracy is. It's two wolves and one chicken deciding what is for dinner. Two wolves. One chicken deciding what is for dinner. There you go, fried chicken for dinner. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let me give you another example, a democracy. Let's say uh, my good friend here, Eddie, and I, we get together. Two. Then, uh, uh, what is your name? Coneida. We have three people. But he, 
Eddie and I unite, and we make a law is saying that whatever she has is ours. Yeah. And it's two against one. Who's going to win? Two. 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 So we vote, and it's legal to take what she has. It's legal because it's the law. It's immoral. Is it ethical? Is it Christian? No. It's not. No. That's what a democracy is. When you have the majority deciding for the minority what they have to do. They have to comply. They have to comply. Oligarchy is the government of the few. And that's what we have today. Uh, Congress, the Supreme Court, and the President are not governing the nation. They are puppets. I don't know if you, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah. They are puppets. They have been controlled and manipulated by the powers to be that we don't see them, but we know who they are. That's why. That's why. That's, what, that's who they are. So whether you are a Republican or a Democrat doesn't make any difference. You see that we have presidents who are conservative, and then we have presidents who are liberal. Is the con is is country getting better? Is the country improving? Nope. It doesn't make any difference who's in the White House or who's running Congress or the Supreme Court because they follow another agenda. Right, That's right. They follow another agenda. Whether they are Republicans or they are Democrats, liberals, progressive, or conservative, whatever name you want, label you want to put on them. Okay? Number four, government is monarchy. That's what we're heading to. One man ruling. Ruling. That's a papacy eventually. Mm -hmm. Number five, anarchy. And that's what is, that is going to happen after the fall of the papacy. Anarchy worldwide. Okay? What is another name for anarchy? Revolution. Revolution. That's another name. The book Education, I don't know if you have that book. Page 228 says that the same teachings that destroy France during the French Revolution will destroy and involve the entire world at the end of time. What teachings are those? The king of the south. That's why you have the progressive, the liberals, uh, socialists, communists, Marxists, Atheist. feminists, homosexuals, ecological movement, you name it. Those, all those movements belong to the left. And they will create a situation worldwide, worldwide, that will ruin the world. Then, and only then, when the world is in chaos, now we go to Revelation 18 again, we see a beast coming out of the bottomless pit. That's the papacy. When the world is broken, in misery, in poverty, no freedom, when people have tried the right and the left, and it's not working out, it's not doing any difference anymore, the people now will plead that someone will come and help us and save us and become the new Messiah. And that's the golden time of the papacy will come back to life and rule the world, will rule the right, and will rule the, the left at the same time. Jesus said that the days before he comes, they're going to be days like last day. What was happening? Well, who was ruling Sodom? The left. Oh, you had the homosexuals there. Right, that, that's right. They were, they were running the show. So that movement will be around until Jesus comes. That's why the papacy is supporting the left and the right. Because they control both of them. You know what the book, The Great Controversy, says about the French Revolution? That there was only one class that was flourishing in the decay of a nation. You know who that class was? The Jesuits. Only one class was flourishing. Everybody else was going downhill quickly and being in poverty and no freedom. And they were paupers. It says that they were, at the time of the revolution, the king was supporting the people in Paris. What, what class? The Jesuits. The Jesuits. So there, there was a lot of poverty and misery, no employment, 
The money was of no value whatsoever. There was hyperinflation. You know what hyperinflation is? When it's 25% or higher inflation, that's hyperinflation. When, when you buy a piece of bread in the morning by, I don't know, you pay a dollar in the evening, it's $2. $2. Because of hyperinflation. Money loses its value. His buying power is gone. We're heading that way. That's what I'm trying to say. We're heading that, that way. And by the way, inflation is only created by, this, by the government. By the government. It's the only one that can create inflation. By pumping a lot of money into the economy. And that's what they did. When COVID came around, what happened? They gave us money. Checks. And people were happy. Woo, woo, we have money. We can spend it. Yeah. Spend it quickly. Because that money, the buying power of it is going down. Inflation. So who hurts when we have inflation? The, the poor and the middle class. Not the upper class. Not the upper class. And when I mean the upper class, I'm not talking about millionaires. I'm talking about the people ruling the world. The people who have billions of dollars, not millions. They don't, they don't count penny things. It's millions. Because what? They don't care about inflation because they produce what we buy. All they have to do is to increase a penny on every product, and they have the money. They don't lose any money. So inflation is created on purpose to destroy the middle class. When we have a revolution, the poor become very poor, and the middle class becomes poor. <laughs> and the people in government, they become millionaires. That's what happened. When the French Revolution happened, 1%, 1% own 90% of the wealth in France. 90%. So 99% of the people had only 10% of the wealth in France. You can read the, the, chap, the chapter. It's, it's the French Revolution of the Bible. People, beggars, they were going around asking for money, asking for food, whatever. They just want to eat at least once a day. And that created an environment where the French Revolution happened. And as I said before, who created the French Revolution? The only class that was flourishing were the Jesuits. Amen. Who is running America today? Jesuits. Who is running every other country in the world today? Jesuits. Who is running the media? Jesuits. Who is running the medical establishment? Jesuits. Who is running the press? Jesuits. I don't call it the press, I call it the press. Because it's the press to read what they read. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> CNN. <laughs> Who's running the educational system of the world? And who's running the financial system of the world? They are. Who's running the papacy even? The black pope. Because the pope we have is a Jesuit. They are running everything from the top to the bottom. However, there's a God in heaven Amen. that rules and overrules. Amen. And he has the final word. Amen. He's allowing Satan to show his faith, his true faith. Once again, that's what happened in the cross. Remember when Jesus was dying? And the entire universe was looking down, and they could not believe that God was dying for humanity. That he was hanging between heaven and earth with nothing to his name. A thorn that was his crown made of thorn, his broken body. I mean, you can read the chapter in the Sire of Ages. Amen. They say when Jesus was walking to Calvary, the blood was flowing free, freely from his body. Every step that he took, there was blood there. Every single one of them. People were weeping just by looking at Jesus the way he was. But, but also he said there that he has a, a keenly look on him. Because he's the king, friends. 
He is the king of the universe. Amen. You and I have no idea the humongous price that was paid for your salvation Amen. and my salvation. Praise the Lord. Amen. We do not appreciate it enough. We don't love Jesus, not even 1% of what we should. You have no idea, and I have no idea either, how much heaven invested in our salvation. Amen. None whatsoever. Amen. If we did, we would live different lives. If we knew that we're about to end human history, we would not live as we're living. If we know that Jesus is about to come, but before he comes, he has to come out of the most heavenly, most holy place in heaven. And when that work is done, it's done forever, friends. We would make different decisions. Amen. Our priorities will be very different as well. We cannot live in just life as any other day. Business as usual, it will be out. It will be more time for him, more time for missionary work, more time for our families, more time for Bible, more time for prayer, and who knows what. But we would be different people all together. So when he was walking, there was blood in every step that he took. Then heaven was looking down and Satan and his angels. There were thousands of them around the cross. Telling Jesus, look, look. You're dying for them. Look how they treated you. You would not be united with your father again. Don't forget the, pa the father withdrew his presence from him. You're alone. Nobody likes you. Nobody loves you. Nobody wants you. Nobody appreciates what you're doing. What are you doing on the cross? Come down and go up. They don't deserve what you're doing. And Jesus could not see beyond the portal of the tomb. That's all he saw. Death. Death ahead of him. What I'm saying this is because you and I must have the faith that Jesus had when he was hanging on the cross. Because at that moment, Jesus knew the character of his father. And he let himself go, not knowing that there was nothing underneath him. However, there they were the hands of his father to hold him. He didn't know that, though. Because he died as a human being. God did not die on the cross. The human died, not God. He's immortal. He was divine, and he was human. God cannot die. He's immortal. Isn't that what we learned this morning? When she was teaching the class. God is immortal. He, he cannot die. So humanity died. Yes. 100%. But not divinity. But at that moment, it was humanity facing the crisis. Not divinity. He never used his divinity to make it easy for him. That's a temptation that you and I have, do not have. Because we are not divine. We are just human. At the end of the book, in, in Revelation, tells us that the faithful people of God will have the faith of Jesus. Not faith in Jesus. We need to have faith in Jesus. They will have the same faith that Jesus had when he died on the cross. Yeah. How do we develop faith? Communion with heaven. It's by the word of God that faith comes, right? So as we take, where's my Bible, right? This book seriously. And we follow what the book says, what is happening to our faith? Growing. It's growing, it's increasing. But if we don't have faith, it's because we don't have the book. Remember when Satan came around in the wilderness? Three times. How did Jesus answer to him? It is written. It is written. What happened to the devil three times in a row? He was defeated every single time. To the point when Jesus said, go, don't bother me no more. And he did. 
They had to get away from Jesus because there is power in the word of God. Amen. Amen. That word created the universe. Every piece of it, every inch of it was created by the word of God. And the universe is humongous. It's so big that we cannot see the end of it. And that was created by the word of God. And that powerful word we have it right here. Amen. So the same power that created the universe gave us this book. Amen. Amen. We do not appreciate this book enough. If we did, we'll be, we'll be in it a lot more. Not only just in it, we'll be following it a lot more. Amen. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. It's by faith that we're saved, right? Mm -hmm. So faith is essential. No faith, no salvation. It's only by faith as we walk with God. It's only by faith as we grow in grace. It's only by faith as we understand the plan of salvation. It's only by faith as Jesus' righteousness is imputed and imparted to us. It is only by faith that we'll be there. Hebrew 11, you have the whole faith, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 The whole of faith. No, yeah, the f eventually they will be famous. Verse 13. That chapter says that Moses was willing to leave behind what? The throne of Egypt and be with the people of God. For 40 years in the wilderness. You know, that was the right decision to make. But at that time, it was not the right decision to make. Right now, Moses is, a, is in a much better place. Yeah. Otherwise, he would be in a museum in Egypt. Maybe. He would be a stinky body there. There would be a stinky body there. He's walking with God today. He was in the presence of God today. Amen. Because he made the decision by faith. He was looking not at the throne of Egypt as something to gain. He was looking at a city that was built with no hand. That's Jerusalem. And because his eyes were there, even though his body was here, he's there today. And he's working in that city today by faith. So when God says, I want you to, to change your diet, what are we going to do? Faith. By faith, we're going to do what God says. It's not easy. Tell me, I'll, I'll, it wasn't easy for me. But by faith, we can walk with God. When he says, I want you to move out of the city, what are we going to do? Move. move. By faith. See, the currency of heaven is not the dollar. The currency of heaven is faith. That's the only currency in heaven. Faith. It's not pesos or dollars or any other currency. It's faith. And how is the economy of heaven doing? Rich. It's rich. Imagine if... The streets are made of gold as the economy heaven, friends. Oh, you, you didn't get that. <laughs> <laughs> if the streets are uh, pavement, pavement is gold in heaven. How is the economy in heaven, friends? Great! It's out of this world. <laughs> it's out of this world. It is out of this world. <laughs> By the way, that's, that's my retirement plan. It's out of this world. So God will provide what we need when we're willing to follow what he says. When he told Moses, take my people out of Egypt, Moses had no budget, not a penny, not a penny. You were slaves, no money. He says, Moses, what do you have? I have a, a stick. That's good enough. You say when I tell you to. And he did, and every time Moses used it on the God's direction, something big happened. 
the sea open. Eventually, the river open. Manna came down every morning. Water, even in the wilderness, out of a rock. What happened to the Jews after 40 days, 40 years? As good as new? What happened to the cloth? I guess it was American made. <laughs> even, even the sandals never, never wore out. Is God able to do today what he did then? Yes. Do we believe that he had the power to, to do what he did then now? What is holding us back? Faith. 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 It's no resources. God has plenty of resources. Thousand ways. That's why. It's faith. He owns everything. That's why. He owns the cattle. And the hills where the cattle is on. So, if God says, for example, I can change your character. I can get rid of your temper, your impatience, your intemperance. I can make you as I am. Can he accomplish that good, good work? Yes. Does he have the power? Yes. Do we believe that? Yes. By faith. By faith. Pastor. Yes. In the Philippines, there is someone claiming to be God. Well, I'm sure. And there will be many more coming. In, in the, in the. So, as, 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 I, as I relate this to the family, the king of the south today is pushing. You see that the agenda that is moving forward. The laws are being created and so forth. So the king of the south is, is, is now marching on. But soon, failure will come as a result of that mentality. When that failure happens, then the king of the north will take over. How does the king of the north take over? Because America will give him the power to take over. Who has the technology? Who has the economy? Who has the army? America. The papers, they have no army. But America does have an army. And America will give him the power, which is civil power and military power and the technology and even finances to heal that deadly wound. And then it's going to happen what Revelation 13 says, the image of the beast. The church and the state coming together. That image of the beast will create what? The image to the beast, which is a different thing. Sunday law. That's out of Revelation 13. You don't have to use Ellen, Ellen White for that. And then we'll see the beginning of the end of time. And then Jesus coming back soon after that. Amen. What is my point as I come to the end? Because I, I want to give you time for questions. Friends, if there was a time to prepare, it's now. Do not, do not, do not postpone your preparation or my preparation. It is a crime to come every Sabbath to this place and go out like nothing happened. It is a crime nowadays. If we believe that Jesus is about to come and before he comes, he has to finish his work in the most holy place and he has to have a people perfected in character so he can seal them and finish the work. You and I need to be different people. You and I need to be different people. Not only we need to be different people, we have to have different priorities. <coughs> Our priorities is not that my 401k will mature in the future. The 401k will not mature. The 401k will ripe and then spoil. And also, by the grace of God, we need to dedicate more, more time to missionary work. 
yeah, medical missionary work is number one, but also literature work. We have been told that many, not just some, a few, many of the conversions at the end of time will come as a result of the printed pages that were put into people's houses. Pastor, yes. Many Sabbath keepers will have been seated. Yeah. To sister wife. Right, yeah, that's true. Many Sabbath keepers. We're not. We are all Sabbath keepers, but we are not really observing the Sabbath according to God's will. That's, that's very true. You, you, you know what the same man says about the Sabbath? That when we come into the final phase of human history, we will have a deeper understanding of the Sabbath that we have today. And during the loud cry, we will have a greater understanding of the Sabbath of servants that we have today. So even though we keep the Sabbath, we're not really keeping the Sabbath. As God wants us to keep the Sabbath. It's an entire chapter in Testimonies, Volume 6. I, I recommend you to read it. How to prepare for Sabbath. Last night, I read a statement out of that chapter. You remember, you know, putting differences aside and so forth? That statement comes out of that chapter. Okay? And it talks about, for example, it says that it's not appropriate for us to be late for church on Sabbath. Lay activity. It's that, that we should be here on time. And, and also, she said that it's a sin to remain in bed on Sabbath. That's what she said. What well, God says. That's what she wrote. To be in bed in Sabbath. You know, oh, I'm going to sleep in tonight, I'm to this morning, and then I'll be there about 11 o'clock. I'll be for second service. Huh? And that's, in the afternoon. In the afternoon, no more. That's not appropriate. Even she said, don't, don't do your dishes on Sabbath. Don't do them until the Sabbath is over. We can do that because we have many disposables now. Well, that's fine. I mean, if you have 20 people invited and you, and you have 10 plates, you have to wash the, the place because you have to feed the people. But if you have 10, 10 people eating and you have 20 plates, you can wait until the Sabbath is over to do your dishes. So don't, it talks about preparing our clothes. Even our shoes should be prepared. Yes. It, all the meals should be done on time. The house should be tidy and clean and organized before Sabbath because angels come to dwell with us. And then Jesus is welcome to come. And he wants to come and dwell with us on Sabbath. Amen. But if the house is a mess. Jesus is not there, friends. Pastor, even filling up our gas tank is not supposed to be on Sabbath. That's why we should, we should do all of that before Sabbath. Yes, we have six days to do that. That's why. Six days. And the first six days of the week, the, the last day is, is, is gas. And you mentioned about shining the shoes. Yeah. Same thing. Yeah. Mending our clothes or pressing our clothes on Sabbath. None of that. It's appropriate. However, she mentioned what we should be doing. She's talking about visiting people, going to houses, praying for people, Amen. asking, how are you doing? What happened? You didn't show up for church today. Are you all right? Are you sick? Are you discouraged? Can we help you in any way? Yeah, showing love to other people. So go around your neighbors and share with them the good news. The house makes a plate of whatever, rice, a something simple as rice. This is for you. I just want to share with you my blessings. And let the love of God show and reveal through us. Amen. Amen. So we, we will get a, a deeper understanding of keeping the Sabbath. And that's going to be a blessing. But in the meantime, we need to develop an inner experience of walking with God. So we need to get into the most holy place. Don't come out of it until his work is done in us. Get into the most holy place. Same here. You and I go into the most holy place. Jesus, I'm here. I'm not coming out until your work is done in me. Amen. Until your character is my character. Until your righteousness is my righteousness. Then and only then we can come out of the most holy place. To serve God on planet Earth. Amen. Friends, this world is going to become very ugly. Very ugly. You and I have no idea. It says no mind can, can phantom the condition that this world is going to be on. We cannot, we, I mean, you can imagine the worst. It's not even close. Hollywood can create the worst movie. Not even close. 
says this final crisis you cannot compare to any other crisis in human history previous to the final one. There's no comparison. Because Satan is going to give everything he has. And he's ugly. And that ugliness will reveal in the world like never before. Mm -hmm. So that Satan himself will be amazed to see that his, his character is perfectly reproduced in his people. But he will be even more amazed when he sees the character of Christ perfectly reproduced in his people. Amen. What side are we going to be on? It's up, it's up to us. We cannot play with God, friends. There's a storm brewing. You know what I mean? Brewing? In his fury. And no one will stop it. God will. But not yet. He's going to let it to develop at its fullness. Because at that moment, God is going to reveal himself at his fullness the good news is not what Satan is doing, it's what God is willing and able to do in us. Amen. And through his people to finish the work. That's why the family is so important, because it's the only place where we can develop a character for heaven. What happens at home is affecting us and impacting us every single day. The Bible says that iron with iron sharpen. That's marriage, friends. <laughs> iron with iron sharpens. That's marriage. You have another person by your side that you love, and she loves you, or he loves you. And sometimes there are differences. That's how we sharpen a car. Am I willing to submit to the will of God in such a way that even though I do not agree with my wife, this is the case in my case, and I still love her? Or the other way around? Am I willing to love someone in such a way that my desires, my preferences are put aside? I want your happiness more than my happiness. Let me read to you a statement that will show us what I'm trying to share with you this afternoon. If I find it, oh, it's right here. It says, there is nothing so offensive to God or so dangerous to the human soul as pride. That is more offensive to God and more dangerous to the human soul than what? Pride. Than pride. <coughs> of all things, of all things, is the most hopeless and the most incurable. <coughs> Christ urge a blessing 154 if you want this, this statement. 154, 154. The most hopeless and the most difficult to cure is what? Pride. 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 What happened to Lucifer in heaven? Pride. You know that Jesus talked to Lucifer in heaven when, before he was cast out? Yeah. You can read it. History of redemption. It's there. Jesus said, come, come, wait, wait, wait a minute. Don't, don't, don't follow that way. And he showed Satan what was going to happen. If you continue in your rebellion, this is going to happen. You know, bing, 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 bing. And Satan this was convinced that Jesus was right. But then the phrase that continue is deep. It says, but his pride forbade him. Not his mind. He understood what Jesus was saying to him. If you continue going this way, this is going to happen. And he showed him the entire history of humanity. But his pride forbid him. Forbid him. His pride. 
His mind was right. His heart was not. You know what the Bible says about pride? What about that? That's why. And you know what it says about the heart? It says that the heart is full of pride, and pride is deceiving. Pride deceived Satan himself. Imagine that. It wasn't his mind that deceived him. It was his pride. He understood where he was and where he was going to go. But he was not willing because of his pride. He said, he's, you, you can read the same and say, how can I tell the angels? And there were millions of angels following him. How can I tell them that I was wrong? And God was right. And his pride did not allow him to comply or to obey God. See, pride is deceiving us today because the human heart is prideful and deceitful above all things. Who can do it? That means that your heart and my heart is more dangerous than Satan, friends. Imagine that one. Your heart and my heart is more dangerous than Satan himself. Because of the pride. We are in the mess that we're in. And that's where we at home, that's where we got rid of pride. Get rid of pride by the grace of God. Amen. When, I, when I'm willing to say, I'm, I messed up. Or when I'm willing to say, Mom, my, my wife, I, I'd rather do what you said than what I want. If you want to go to Taco Bell and I don't want to go to Taco Bell, I'll go with you. I might eat perhaps a, I don't know, a cup, cup of water. I want a cup of water. That's it I want. To, but but if, if you're enjoying your, your taco and Taco Bell, I'll be with you because I want to make you happy. We don't have to go to El Pollo Loco. We, we can go to Taco Bell. And when I'm willing, because as a man, I'm more powerful than my wife as a woman. Man is 40% more powerful. I have more power, muscle power, than a woman. But if I'm willing to treat her not with power, with love, pride is being overcome. My children, they're small, or they, they used to be. One of them is older than I am. But if I'm willing to love them, if I'm willing to correct them in love, not in wrath, if I'm willing to take my time and invest my time in their education, in winning the hearts, in binding our hearts together, pride, my pride, is being defeated every day. That's why home is so important. It's the only place of preparation for heaven. There's no other place. You can go to Loma Linda and pay all the money you want. They can teach about anatomy, physiology, chemistry, physics, math, languages, political science, whatever. They can teach you a lot. But no class is teaching you how to be a godly man. No class is teaching you how to have a godly home. No class is teaching you how to control your tongue. No class is teaching you how to have a pure mind. Because no place you can be taught that. Only at home, with the Word of God, and the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit, we acquire the righteousness and the character of Jesus. Amen. 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 And then we prepare for heaven. Let, let me read to you a statement just to show you what I'm trying to share with you. This is a letter that Sister White wrote to Pastor James. Uh, uh, not, uh, not Pastor Wedge, Pastor um, Andrews. He was over in Europe as a missionary. Amen. Yeah. Says, you remember I wrote to you from Texas to obtain a wife before you return to Europe. He was already there. Do you suppose I would have given you such counsel if I have no light upon this matter? Be sure, no such counsel would have been given you without good reason. 
listen to this. I was shown that you made a mistake in going to Europe without a good wife. If you had selected a godly woman who could have been a mother to your children, you have done a wise thing. Listen to the end of it. Your usefulness would have been ten times, tenfold to what it has been. And he did a wonderful work over in Europe. He translated articles, books. He preached. He went many places. A lot of people came into the truth. However, she said that God says, if you would have a godly wife as a companion, you would have done ten times more. Is marriage important then? Yes. 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 But let me read it to you another letter. This one is different. This one is, is written to Sister D. We don't know who she was. We know that she was a, a, the wife of a pastor. Sister D. Where is the, that? Pastor was the uh, Adventist home. No, it's, 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 not, it's not in this book. Let, let, let me get my iPad. Oh, it's right here. Sister D, I would not present this matter as I do where there not another life so closely bound up with yours and the life of one whom God has chosen to be his servant. So she was pastor's wife. This marriage ought not to have been Imagine getting a letter like that. <laughs> Saying, you messed up big time. <laughs> but, but, the step has been taken. And for your husband, the work of overcoming is now tenfold more severe. He was trying to rule the household, including the husband. If Andrew would have had a, a godly wife, 10 times more work. But this lady was making that man's work 10 times more difficult. He said, the work of overcoming is now tenfold more severe that if he has never seen you. Would you think seriously of this question? Whether his usefulness shall be destroyed and his life become a failure because of you? Your husband should not merge his identity in you. And I'm not going to read the rest of this, the letter, but you get the picture of it. Marriage will break you or make you. It's an important decision in life. And then we see how at home we can, by the grace of God, develop that godly character that one day will open the gates of heaven for us to get into heaven. Amen. That righteousness, which is imputed righteousness, is our title to heaven. The other righteousness, imparted righteousness, is our fitness for heaven. In one, we have forgiveness, which is an immediate work, and the other one is the life of a lifetime. It takes a while. But God can finish what he began. And he can accomplish his work in you, in me. So one gives me the passport and the ticket, which is paid for, and the visa and the passport. Right? Now I have the plane ticket, I have the visa, I have the passport. However, I need to be fitted to be in the presence of God. Because sin will not rise a second time. That means... That everyone in the universe will be vaccinated against sin one day. Because sin will not erase his ugly head another time. Amen. One time was plenty, was enough. 
So he has to create people that by his grace can continue out of love, obey him. And be nice and kind and tender to other people as well. As I come to the end, you know that this world is can becoming uglier and uglier every single day. Just look at the news. It's depressing. Why you see? The, 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 the evilness, the, the sinfulness, the, the wickedness that we see around us is beyond understanding. When, when my family came to this country years ago, it was a rather good country. Not anymore. Not anymore. I don't, I don't say God bless America. No, I cannot say that. I say God bring judgment on America. No blessings. We have plenty of blessings. How have we paid God for every blessing that we have received? Now bring judgment because judgment will wake people up, some of them, and will prepare a people for his coming. This place that we're on today, one day will be destroyed by God. <clears throat> you know, Sister Hawaii, when she was in Loma Linda, not too far from here, she had a vision. And she saw from, from, from Los Angeles all the way to San Bernardino, this place was wiped out. He didn't say an earthquake. He didn't say what it was. He didn't know what it was. But she saw every this level level destroyed. So you are in a very dangerous place, friends. It says God will do that to wake those who are professing to keep his commandments, but are not keeping his commandments. To wake some people up. Do you know how much money? has been put into Loma Linda? Billions of dollars. And there's more money being put into it. What happens if that building or those buildings fall down and nothing is left? Will, that will wake some people up. So a lot of people are pride, proud for Loma Linda. Oh, look, look what we have done. Look what we have accomplished. We have fame. We have reputation. We have money. To save some people, God will have to destroy a lot of buildings. I'm not saying Loma Linda is going to be one of them. She didn't say what it was. She just saw that the entire valley was wiped out, destroyed. From Los Angeles to San Bernardino. Chapter 11. Now chapter 11. Hmm? All the way to chapter 11. Really? Well, so that is going to happen before the class of probation. And before the son the law, to wake some people up around here. Yeah. Because if this is a dangerous place to be from, it's Loma Linda. It has become the center of apostasy among the people of God. In America, at least. I don't know in other places, but in America. A lot that comes out of it is not good. I'm not saying that everybody's evil or wicked or apostasy. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that because I don't know the hearts. But I can see what I see, and I can tell you what is happening, even though I know a little, and that's plenty to know. I don't need to know more. So God, in his mercy, will bring judgment to wake some people up. I want to finish by reading to you a few questions. No answers. That's, you answer in your heart. Are we keeping everything right with God every day? Question number one. Number quest, question number two. Are we keeping right with our fellow man every day? Are we taking time daily to study God's word? Are we spending time every day in earnest prayer and contact with God? Are we cultivating love for heavenly things? Are we being careful with our conversation and communication? The last one, are we improving every opportunity that we have to witness for Jesus in word and deed? I hope that by the grace of God, we can say yes. Amen. If not, there's hope. 
days time. Just pray, God, I am determined by your grace to begin this very hour to live for eternity. Amen. I cannot, I will not be a fool and run the risk of losing eternity. That life that you have provided for me at an infinite price. Amen. May God bless us, friends, as we come to the end of the meeting. All right, if we have any question, and if we don't, then we pray and we're dismissed. What? No question. Okay, let's. Oh, there's a question in the back. Hold on. I have a question, Pastor. Yes. Uh, reading Revelation 12, and now that you spoke about America. And the image of the beast giving the power to the to the first beast. It said that there was a woman. John saw a woman clothed, right? She was clothed with the uh, the sun, the moon under her feet, and that this woman fled to the wilderness. to the, the wilderness. Mm -hmm. But then I go to Revelation 17, and now John sees another woman, and he was very astonished because this woman had fornicated and had blood of the martyrs. So is this woman the same woman that John saw because he got astonished? And I'm putting that together so it makes sense why he was astonished. First, this woman was pure, America, right? But then it's giving the the seed to the beast, and so now it becomes this great whore that persecutes God's people. So my question is, this is the same woman that John saw because he was astonished of what she had done. Okay. In Revelation, we have two different women. Revelation 12, you had a woman that is pregnant. You see the pregnant. That's the transition between the Old Testament church and the New Testament church. Is pregnant because of Jesus is about to be born. So you see the transition from the Old Testament Israelite people to the Christian church of today. So that's a woman of Revelation 12. That's Amen. faithful to God. She's, she's clothed with the garments of God. She has what the moon under her feet. And also she has 12 what? Stars. Which is the, you know, the 12 patriarchs, and then the 12 apostles, and so forth. So that's a different woman than Revelation 17. The woman in Revelation 17 is the mother, not just a whore, is the mother of all whores. So, so there we see that that's a reference to the, to the papacy. Okay? Yes. But then it says that the dragon was wroth with the remnant, mm -hmm. not the actual woman. No, yep. So I'm trying to, record. I understand what you're saying, and that's been our teaching forever. However, it kind of makes sense that now John is astonished because eventually this woman is going to apostatize and unite with the papacy and persecute God's church, mm -hmm. the remnant, you know? Right. Revelation 12, 17, that's what you mentioned. You see that um, the, the dragon is, is, is wrath with the woman. However, the war is against the remnant. That woman, if you are, this is Revelation 17, Revelation 16, you see the beginning of, of America. When America opened his mouth and swallowed up the water or the persecution that was coming out of Europe, that's established of America as a nation of freedom, of Protestant faith, and of a republic. So the, America opened the mouth of the border, and the people that were persecuted come over, and they were able to find freedom here in this country. If you go to Revelation 13 now, because in Revelation 12, you have six encounters between Christ, Michael, and the dragon. In Revelation, there are seven encounters between Christ and the dragon, Christ and Satan. Six of them are in Revelation 12. The last one is in Revelation 20, when Jesus comes the third time, and the devil is destroyed. That's the last one. 
So here we see that the papacy, I'm sorry, that the dragon, Satan, and when I mean the dragon, the dragon means governments and also the spiritualism. There are two applications to the dragon. Okay. As the dragon is persecuting the church, or not persecuting, wrath with the church, angry with, with it. However, out of that church, out of that movement, the Reformation movement comes out another movement, the Seventh-day Adventist movement. That movement is the one that the enemy will persecute because they believe in keeping the commandments of God, and also they have accepted what the testimony of Jesus, which is a spirit of prophecy. Not every Seventh-day Adventist is part of the remnant, though. If you don't have the spirit of prophecy, you are not a Seventh-day Adventist. You might believe in Jesus' second coming. You are an Adventist, but you are not a Seventh-day Adventist. And if you don't believe in, in overcoming sin and keeping the commandments of God by the grace of God, you are not a Seventh-day Adventist. The new theology, that's what it's teaching. No victory over sin. You will continue sinning until Jesus comes. That's not right. That's wrong. So even though you might profess to be part of the movement, you are not really part of it. Only those who are benefited by the work of Jesus in the most holy place where we have the grace to overcome sin and keep all his commandments. And also we believe and receive the testimony of Jesus. Those will be the one persecuted by the dragon. The dragon in Revelation 13 has two allies, two pieces, one out of the earth, and another one out of the sea. The papacy is the one out of the sea, and America is the one out of the earth. Those two allies who pretend to be Christians, both of them, will persecute the people of God. But also, those that one time rejoice in this message, but were not sanctified by the obedience to the truth, will forsake the truth, we have been told. As we come, this says, a week, as the storm is approaching, a large group that profess to be believers in the truth, but were not sanctified by the obedience to the truth, will forsake the truth and join with the opposition. And they will become the most severe enemies and persecuted of, pe of the people of God. So in Revelation 14, we have the other side of the coin. Revelation 13, you have the two allies of dragon. In Revelation 14, you have God's allies. You have 144,000 on Mount Zion. And the name of the Father is written in their foreheads, right? And, which is a character. And if you go to Isaiah 57, 17 says that the name of God is holy. So that name that is on, the, on their forehead is holiness unto the Lord. And what is holiness is constant agreement with God. That's what, the, what it says, constant agreement with God and wholeness to God. That's holiness. That's holiness because with that holiness, we cannot be in the presence of God and be alive. We will be consumed just like that. So God now, at the end of time, has a group of people that defeated the dragon, the beast out of the earth, and the beast out of the sea. Why? Because of Revelation 14, 6 to 12, the three angels messages. Because of that message, that group of people were able, in the power of God, to defeat three powers at the end of time. And that message is so powerful that when you see the end of the three angels messages, the following verse, 13, what it says, that those who died in, their, in believing in the three angels messages, there is a special resurrection for them. So Seventh-day Adventists will never be part of the first resurrection. Seventh-day Adventists will be part of the special resur resurrection. Amen. And if you're apostatized, you will be part of the second resurrection, but no first resurrection for Seventh-day Adventists. That's a special resurrection or the second one, not the first one. So God, through that powerful message, prepare a people. And not only prepare a people, prepare people who are dead. For special resurrection. But that's not the end of it. As you continue reading Revelation 14, what do you find? Now there's a son of man coming in the clouds of heaven. And he has what in his hand? A sickle. Sharp sickle. What's that for? To harvest. So that three angels' messages prepare the entire world for Jesus' second coming. Thus, some will be collected as grain. Those, the others, will be grapes. And they will be trampled on in the great vine of God. 
But everyone, when Jesus comes, everyone will be ready. One way or another. That's why we have been told that three angels' messages is the most powerful message ever entrusted to human beings. And we have the greatest amount of light that we have ever been given to any human being. Amen. Friends, we cannot play games, friends. If we believe to be what we believe to be, we, we got to get with the game, friends. And it's not a game, by the way. We got to get serious with the Lord. Amen. That's why. And, 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 and then that house of message will prepare a people. That people will be ready as well. And even the warnings, the loss, will be ready. No message in 6,000 years has ever done that. I mean, Noah had a powerful message. Elijah had a powerful message. John the Baptist had a powerful message. But no mas- message is so powerful as the three angels' message is. That's why the devil hates it so much. And he has been successful in silencing that voice. Even among the people of God. We need to proclaim it. Amen. But to proclaim it, we have to leave it. If you don't leave it, don't proclaim it. You have nothing to proclaim. You're just a fraud and a front. But if you leave it, it's in your heart, and it's transforming your life, praise God. You will be used by God to finish your work. Amen. So that's, that's my, my question to, to the question of the brother about Revelation 12 and Revelation 17. Perhaps there's more than one application. I'm not saying you, you are wrong. I'm, I'm just trying to show you what I believe is, is right. But once again, perhaps the time will tell us more about that. Okay? Time to finish? All right. Okay. Any more questions? Yes. yes. Uh, country living, people who are going to the country now and re- have gardens are now the bullseye for the left. There's a, uh, I saw an interview yesterday um, by Tom Schaller and Paul Waldman. They wrote a book called White Rural Rage. And these are, they're describing patriots and they're calling them dangerous. And so, just FYI, uh, they're really focusing now. And, and having a garden, I saw interview of, uh, college students. What do you think of people who grow their own gardens and they're being taught that it's wrong, it's um, nonsense. Anyway, so so well, they're focusing on you and everybody yeah. out there. Well, there's, there's a lot Adrian. of um, well, there's a lot of propaganda in the news, in the media. Please, uh, I know. What, what I'm trying to tell you is, is this. I, I believe that Satan knows that God has people who are preparing for what is coming. And he will do whatever he can to try to place fear in the heart of the people of God so they don't do what God says. Oh, I'm not saying that to cause fear. No, no, no. And, and it's, it's true. Uh, let me give you an, another example. In Detroit, if you are in the city of Detroit, you can have flowers, ornaments, but no fruit or veggies in your yard. And that's the law in, the, in Detroit. <laughs> so there was a lady, an old lady. Well, I should not say older. I should say older lady, not an old lady. An older lady that was cultivating, you know, you know, tomatoes, whatever. The city came down on her and says, you need to take every plant out. We'll give you 24 hours. In 24 hours, you don't do it. We'll come and do it for you. So, so Satan is preparing the mindset of the people, really. So country living is looked down like something that is not good, that somehow they will be able to control God will protect his people that are willing to do what he says. When Noah was building the ark, there were a lot of people saying, that man is crazy. By the way, the Bible, not the Bible, the Spirit of Prophet says that Noah was considered a fanatical man. 
and a crazy man in his days. But what, what happened when the flood came? He made it. What happened to the antediluvians? They were saving for a rainy day, if you know what I mean. Eh? By the way, when Noah got into the ark, he was a minority. When he came out of it, he was a majority. God, God will do the same at the end. I was reading an article just a few days ago. You know, the, the, <clears throat> the Davos meeting in Switzerland, once a year they, they come together, Davos, okay. They are saying that the people who are, who are planting, they are contributing more CO2 than any other person on planet Earth. Five times more, they say. It's not true. There's no science behind that. But that's what they are saying. What they are saying is we need to take care of the farmers, if you know what I mean. When I mean take care, it's not in a nice way. Well, you see what is happening in Germany right now with the farmers. Holland, Netherlands, that's why. In Canada, in America, in many other places, what are doing the farmers? They're protesting. Why? Because they are creating laws to destroy farmers. Why? Because Satan knows God's plan. So he's doing all he can to destroy God's plan. God will allow him to move forward to some degree, but not 100%. Eventually, God is going to say, enough is enough. You're not going to go any farther. And God will benefit his people and protect his people and reward his people for doing what he says that we need to be doing. But it's true. The mindset is being created to see us as evil people, wicked people, unpatriotic people, people that need to be destroyed, and so forth. But God will take care of us. I'm, I'm sure of that. Okay? Do we have any other questions? Yes, there's one in the back. <coughs> the um, Spirit of Prophecy has about the two messengers, that it's the Old and the New Testament. And I've been trying to kind of follow a little bit about uh, uh, explanation of it, along with my husband, that's an elder here, so ask him questions. But um, I saw two, and it might be just because it's on on the uh, internet doesn't mean it's real. But of two pastors, Sunday keeping pastors had taken the Bible and uh, act like a football, and they and one said, "I'm gonna um, receive and, and you kick," and they kicked the Bible across the stage, funny in a funny way. And then another one where uh, an evangelist was on the street uh, in a university and that they had, the kids had taken the Bible and ripped it and then put it into the porta potty and then showed it in, in the excrement. And it hurts my, my heart to hear that, to see of the, God's word. And it was like, would they do that to the Torah? Would they do that? You know, it's lawlessness and the way they're taking God's word and just throwing it in the street. And I'm wondering if that prophecy, to me, it seemed like it's being fulfilled more and more. And now God, it's getting more godless and doing away with God well, and yeah. everything. So I just wanted to share, get, get to know your word and keep God's word close to your heart and try to memorize as much as you can because there might come a time when they be throwing it in the street like they are. Yeah. Okay, in, in, in Revelation 11, you find that that the word of God was thrown into the streets for three and a half years. But eventually what happened to it? It came back to life. <laughs> it came back to life. So that, that's why. Is this a book that Satan hates? Is this one? Yeah, this one. Yes. I have a quick question. Um, yes. I'm not sure if I misheard you, but did you say before anarchy, the, the papacy will fall? No. After that. Oh, okay. Anarchy, we create a condition for the papacy to come back. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. But if you, in Revelation 17 and also 18, you see the fall of Babylon. Mm -hmm. And Babylon is made up of three systems. And every one of them will fall. But that will be after the National Sunday Law, not before the National Sunday Law. By the way, eventually the National Sunday Law will become a universal Sunday Law. That's in Revelation 13, 3, when it said that the world wonder after the beast, the entire world will wander after the beast. That's universal Sunday law. Yeah. Okay. okay, well, I guess that's, that's it. Oh, there's, there's, oh, prayer? Okay, all right, let's, let's, let's kneel for prayer and we'll be dismissed.
Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Amen. Is that all we have? We have more than we need. The greatest gift ever. What a friend, what a creator, what a sustainer, what a redeemer, what a savior, what a high priest. Amen. Father, help us to love, to love Jesus like we had never loved him before. 24-7. Yes. Every moment of the day, we're just in love with him and more and more and even more. As we behold Jesus, we become changed. Amen. Then his righteousness and his character become our righteousness and our character. Yes, Father, we need victory over sin. We know that the devil is angry and he's making war. And we can see the signs of that war all over. But let's not be afraid. He's a defeated foe. He will not win at the end. He has never won and he, will, he never will. Help us to love you in such a way that we dedicate every moment of the day to you. And also we dedicate a life to service for others. To love you and to love our neighbor. And to do all that we can not to move us forward. Not to be better than anybody else. On the contrary. Just to be faithful and humble servants in your hand. Amen. Father, praise this congregation. Bless it. And everyone that is here and every family that is represented here. I pray for revival and reformation among the people of God. I pray that we will run with the truth as never before. This light will be put high and every day higher and higher until everyone can see it around the world. Amen. Oh, Father, help us to finish the work and come and take us home. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.